thank you for joining us for our worship service. It's always great just to be able to, um, to worship together and be able to share God's word together with you. Um, we are glad that you're here. Um, we're coming to an end of our study in Romans, and it's been a great, a great series. I feel like um, God has really taught us as a church so much through this, through this really great book um, on this letter written to the Roman church by Paul. And we're in chapter 16 now, so as the Apostle Paul, he brings this letter to a close. As in most of his letters, he is going to close with, um, with uh, a section of greeting, um, greetings to some of the people of the church. Um, in letter writing today, we typically start with a greeting, but um, in these times they ended with a greeting. So this is what we're going to see in, the, in this particular chapter today. Um, Paul ends this letter to these recipients and he names um, several of them. He mentions about 26 of them by name and others um, that, that go unnamed that are also greeted and I was just thinking there's probably hundreds, maybe even thousands of people in this network of churches, um, these churches in Rome. So the, the thought for me and the question um, perhaps for us is, is why does Paul single out these people? Why does he specifically greet um, this, the, the, these people, about 26 of them by name? What makes them so special, um, commendable? And deserving of praise. What are the things in these people's lives that would even prompt Paul or, or bring Paul to the place of writing their names in this letter? And I think if Paul were writing a letter today um, to the church, even if he was writing a letter today to uh, to Lifesong Church, the epistle to Lifesong, what kind of people would he actually include? Who would actually be mentioned um, in these greetings um, to the church. So we're going to see um, today what makes these people um, commendable um, for each person that he that he greets by name. He attaches this, this description, a brief description for us. And looking at the way that he describes them is very key to understand what is commendable, what really is commendable, not only by Paul, but what is commendable to the Lord. Um, for his church. And many of these descriptions that we're going to see that they're just one word and it's really just one characteristic. So it's likely um, the most prominent or memorable characteristic of, of the named persons. So if there is one word to describe you, um, what would it be? Um, if there is one word that, that describe you, what would be or what would you want it to be? And Paul is going to give us just a good list to start with. Um, so just to warn you, there are a lot of names here. And one thing that, that I've learned is that when you come to a passage like this with a lot of names, that some of them are hard to pronounce. Um, but if you just read them confidently, like you know what you're, um, you're talking about, then it sounds very good. <laughs> but I'm not saying that I, I know what I'm talking about, but I'm gonna read these names and try to read them, um, um, yeah, just, just confidently. Um, so open up to Romans 16, verses one through 16. And I'm gonna read the whole chapter. Um, the whole the whole section, not the whole chapter. So starting from verse one, I commend you, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Centre, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need help from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Um, verse three, greet Prissa and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my sake, for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epinatus, who was the first con um, convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles and they were in Christ before me. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. And verse 13, greet Rufus. Chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Patrobus, Hermas, 
and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nurus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. So many names. I know there are many names and many um, commendable characteristics mentioned here. But for the sake of time and, and just in this passage, we're going to take a look at a few and we're going to group some of these characteristics together. Um, and so the first commendable characteristic um, that we see here, the first mark of a commendable person is this. It's a servant's heart, a servant's heart. If you want your name written in the book, um, if, if there is a book being written today. If you want your name being written in the book, um, first things first is to be a servant, to be a servant. The first person commended here in, in this section is Phoebe. And, and she's given a few verses of recognition here. She is from the church in Centre, and, and that's it's a neighboring city of Corinth. And Corinth is likely the place where Paul is actually writing this letter um, to, to the people of Rome. And Phoebe is likely the person who is delivering the actual letter um, to Rome. And she is described a few ways in our passage. It says that one, that she is a servant and, and that she has been a great help to many. So a few commendable qualities, a few qualities uh, of just a commendable person um, is to be a servant and, and, and to be a helper. Um, a few months ago, we were in Romans 12, and, and one of the pivotal passages, um, if you remember Romans 12, um, 12, 1, it says, I, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So we are urged in this passage, in light of God's mercies, because of God's mercies, in response to that, to offer our entire lives as a living sacrifice, um, as worship unto the Lord. And one of the clearest um, outworkings of our faith, and one of the first things that Paul mentions here, um, in, back in Romans 12, is, is our service unto the Lord. Um, offer your lives as a living sacrifice, um, how do you do that? Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. Uh, in many ways, um, um, as we as we hear Paul recognizing um, all of these people um, in, in the church in Rome, um, recognizing Phoebe, um, and, and recognizing all of these others um, in our church as well. There are certainly um, just a number, a number of servants that I believe would um that, that paul would include in, in, in this letter and i won't name names but um just just those who serve in children's ministry those who serve youth those who serve college young adults in our seniors group vineyard group women's ministry um those who are are doing things in the background during worship service on the av teams praise teams up in front um setup team the ohana team our hospitality crew um our newly forming safety team um, you are all truly servants of the Lord, and, and that is so commendable. And, and I and I do believe that 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 is one of the qualities and characteristics that that stands out to Paul and stands out to the Lord. And and uh, we just thank you. We just thank you for your service. Um, truly servants and well deserving of of recognition. Um, we see that Phoebe, she was a servant at her church. And Paul also specifies something else about her, that she was a helper. It says that she was a great help to many. So what's the difference here? What's the difference between a servant and a helper? It seems like um, they're kind of one in the same, that, that they're kind of the same thing or the same quality. But in other translations in, in our passage, the word that they use for helper is... Um, is translated um, patron, which is in our our, our um, version, the ESV. Um, but also there's another um, word called um, benefactor. And other translations use helper. Um, but in other words, Phoebe was likely, um, being a benefactor or patron, she's likely um, wealthy, possibly a, a businesswoman. Um, she had funds. And one of the ways that she helped Many says that she was helped to many was through her generosity, that it was through her, um, her, 
Her generosity, her hospitality, um, she helped people in need. She helped people that were possibly in distress and she gave to them generously. And she offered hospitality that others might be helped. Um, Phoebe was known as a servant and a helper. And, and this was memorable to Paul. This is one of the, the characteristics that um, is very commendable and that Paul is, is thanking her for. Um, so for us as a church, um, try, we, we need to, to look to, to cultivate this servant's heart and, and, and this generosity in our lives. Um, as Phoebe had, uh, maybe having the eyes to see the needs of others, having the eyes to see the needs um, perhaps in the church and to, and to move towards serving, to serving and meeting those needs. Maybe it's having the eyes to see the struggles of others and, and, and those who might be in need. Um, and, and maybe it's growing in generosity toward them and being a great help to them maybe moving toward others with this posture and this initiative um, of service and generosity. So what are some ways that you can, you can grow in this area, in, in, these, in these characteristics? Um, so that's the first commendable quality that, that Paul lists here. The next commendable and admirable quality um, that Paul points out to us is this. It's, it's a sacrificial life, a sacrificial Life is a willingness to sacrifice for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of others. In verse three, it says we read about this couple, Prissa and Aquila. Um, it's the same um, Priscilla and Aquila that we um, read about in Acts 18. Um, they were co-laborers with Paul. Um, they were actually tent makers where we get that name um, tent making even, even today. And, and they also served in many capacities at their church. They were teachers. They opened up their home. Um, for, for church as well. Um, verse, um, verse three says, Paul says, Greet Prissa and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk, who risk their necks for, for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. So, so what stands out immediately um, in this verse is that they were fellow workers who risked their lives for the sake of Paul. It says they risked their necks, they risked their lives for the for gospel ministry. And the, the time or the exact situation that they're talking about, it's not known for sure. Um, some, some will say that it could have been um, the riots that we, that we hear about in Ephesus in, in Acts 19. Um, when, when the rioting crowd, they, they dragged Gaius and Aristarchus into the theater. Those were Paul's companions. And we read that there are some disciples that didn't let Paul um, go into the crowd because Paul probably wanted to get into that crowd. But there are some disciples that were holding him back. And you kind of get this picture if you watch any kind of kind of sporting events and there's little scuffles that happen. And there's always those teammates that are, that are holding, holding their teammate back. And so perhaps this is what um, what was happening. Perhaps Priscilla and Aquila were, were holding Paul back um, because they they were fearing for his life. They were protecting him, um, doing whatever was needed for his safety and for his well-being. They risked their lives. It says they risked their necks for, for Paul. Um, to risk, um, it means this. It means to expose oneself to danger, harm, or loss. Um to expose oneself to danger, harm, or loss. So Prissa and Aquila, they exposed themselves to danger, harm, and loss, risking their lives for the sake of their friend, for the sake of their beloved friend, and ultimately for the sake of the gospel. It is, it is, they, they, they did this. They risked themselves for that. So what does this look like for us Um um, maybe it's not it's not exactly risking our lives, um, but certainly it could be exposing ourselves to possible harm, um, possible loss, for the sake of others. Um, it could it could be in the form of laying down our comfort or setting aside our comforts or even our, our reputation um, for the sake of others. It can be um, protecting others. 
um, standing up for others when, when, when you know that it's, it might not be the popular thing to do, that it might not be the popular stance. Uh, maybe, maybe it's standing up for someone who's vulnerable or even in danger. And in, in this way, we risk ourselves for them. Uh, th there's a phrase that is used oftentimes, I think mostly in the military. And I know the only reason why I know this is because I watch movies. Um, and some of my military friends say this, but they say, I got your six. Right? I got your six. You used to communicate position. So 12 o'clock, meaning straight ahead. Um, six o'clock, meaning right behind you. And I'm, I'm terrible at this. Um, when somebody says, says like, um, at your four o'clock, I'm on four o'clock. Okay, wait, is that, is that like, um, no, it's not, oh, 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 it's that way. And, and by the time I figure out what four o'clock is, you know, that whatever I needed to look at is, it, it is gone. Um, but when someone says, I got your six, it, it means that, that they're saying that I got your back. I got your back. It's, it's this declaration of, of loyalty that I'm loyal to you. I got you covered that I'll protect you, especially from behind. And I think this, this can be hard to come by in some ways these days. I feel like once a person, uh, perhaps once a person is in danger or if a person is being maligned or a person is, 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 is being threatened, so many people might just turn and maybe turn a blind eye and just kind of mind, I just gotta mind my own business and not get involved in this. Um, social media is actually um, really obvious in the way that people will turn on someone so so quickly. Um, but when it comes to the gospel and, and, and gospel messengers and brothers and sisters in the Lord, we should be known for protecting each other, that, that we should be known for speaking well uh, of each other, for standing up for and for standing with each each other, to expose ourselves um, to danger, to harm, um, even if it means that 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 we're we're going to be harmed, um, perhaps even looked down on, um, facing some kind of loss for the sake of our friend, and ultimately for the sake of the gospel. So this kind of sacrificial living is seen in the way that we expose ourselves. To, to danger, harm or, or harm, or loss for the sake of, of others. And the love that Prissa and Aquila had for Jesus and the gospel, it moved them to lay it all on the line, um, to sacrifice whatever was needed for the furtherance of the, go of the gospel and for their, their dear brother in the Lord, Paul. So sacrificial living. It's very, um, that was one, one, another thing that was very commendable. Um, that Paul mentions. The next quality, admirable quality that Paul mentions in our passage is this. It's, um, it's being a, a diligent and tireless worker. Just being a, a tireless worker for the Lord. The church is made up of people who, who work hard together for the Lord. Um, Paul repeatedly mentions how, how many of them, many of them were, were co-laborers that they were co, um, fellow workers and that they were servants in the Lord. This theme of, of being workers, of being workers. Phoebe was a servant in, this, in the church at Centre at 6-1. Paul calls Prissa and Aquila my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. That's in verse 3. He calls Urbanus our fellow worker in Christ. He commends those fellow workers of the gospel throughout the passage. And here we see that, that one of the most important and commendable characteristics um, uh, of the church is, is that, is that they are fellow workers, that they are fellow workers. Paul mentions a few others. Um, he mentions Mary. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure who this Mary is. There's a lot of Marys in the Bible, but he says, greet Mary, greet Mary who has worked hard for you. Um, that's in, in verse six. Says so the Greek Trophena and Tryphosa, they're likely sisters, um, but but he says that they were workers in the Lord. Persis, um, who also worked hard in the Lord, and this description is a little bit different than 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 how he describes um, Phoebe and Prissa and Aquila. Um, this this description, uh, it's 
it's a little bit different um, the way that he describes Mary and Trophana and Trophosa and Persis. Um, you could kind of read it as, as described as ones who have labored, who have labored to the point of exhaustion. And that's the description of, of, of how they are workers in the Lord, that they, they are ones who have labored to the point of exhaustion for you. Um, there's this idea of working until you're worn out. Um, to toil um, with physical and mental effort until you are just spent. And that's, that's when, when we read, um, just for example, greet Mary who has worked hard for you, who has, who has labored to the point of exhaustion for you. I'm sure many of you have met our um, um, fairly new intern, um, David, David King. We call him DK. DK for short, um, but just a great guy, a great guy, just a blessing um, just to know and to um, to co-labor with. Um, godly, passionate, servant, um, come think of pretty much a lot of these um, commendable qualities just seen in him as well. But aside from that, um, if you talk to him and, and um, you, you'll find out that there's other things that he really enjoys. And that one, another thing is just fitness and that he's like a fitness expert um get getting taught if you start talking to him about working on fitness you'll find that that this is one of the things that one of the other things that he loves and so um um started started uh, to work out a little bit with david and um want to continue to try with david but one thing about um just working out with with this dear brother is that really you're pushed to this point of exhaustion and this point of weariness, not just physically, but, but mental, even this mental exhaustion. Even after workout, a workout, I'm just spent. And, and I'm, um, I could, I, I walk a little different. I could barely walk and for a few days, I'm walking a little differently. Um, but it's, it's a good kind of, of exhaustion. It's a good kind of tired. And it's actually a satisfying kind of tired. And, and, and I do think that this is what Mary and others felt time and time again. I, I, I believe that this is what Paul felt repeatedly over and over again. This kind of exhaustion, not, not this exhaustion from working out um, or exercising, but from working hard for the Lord. Um, of being tired at the end of the day because because you are working hard for the Lord. And, and, and that's it's a good kind of tired. It's a satisfying kind of tired. Maybe some of you have been on, whether it's um, short-term missions or even, even a day of serving, serving in the community or, or an extended day of serving in the church. Um, I remember times of, of being in, in, in Mexico and serving, um, spending the day doing VBS, playing with kids, um, teaching lessons, um, sometimes building homes. And those nights, those nights were so peaceful and quiet um, because everyone was so tired from the day's work. Um, this is probably um, a common occurrence for, for many of these believers. For Mary, possibly having days filled with this kind of gospel work. For Phoebe, um, likely she spent time with, with individuals. Um, she was a help to many, maybe supporting them in their needs, hearing their stories, counseling them, practicing generosity. She was working for the Lord. Prissa and Aquila, um, on top of their, their full-time jobs as tent makers, that it says that they, that they hosted church in their home. They led Bible study. In, in Acts, it records them, them teaching a man named Apollos um, just the doctrines of the faith, and they're working hard for the Lord. And I do believe that there were probably times when they just felt that exhaustion um, at the end of the day. And God has given us, God has given us this mission. He's given each of us gifts and we know that one of the clearest outworkings of our faith is to serve him and to work hard for the Lord. Um, 
In, in 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11, it says this. It says, as each has received a gift, use it. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. And he, Paul also says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, he says, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. In whatever area that God has given you, whatever area he leads you, he says to do it, to give yourself um, to it and calls to do it all for the glory of God. So church, on this point here, um, let's let's work hard at serving the Lord. Let's work hard at serving one another. Um, this is one of the one of the character qualities, one of the admirable traits that Paul he he commends um, in the church that they are fellow workers, and that they often work to that point of exhaustion. Um, doing the work of the Lord and serving others. And lastly, the next commendable and admirable quality that Paul points out here, um, one of the many, but, but the fourth one that we're going to look at is that they were in Christ, that they were in Christ, that they were saved, that they were brothers and sisters in Christ. One, one thing that we notice about the church in Rome is that it was made up of, of a lot of ordinary people, but very diverse. It's very diverse that there were Jews and Gentiles, there were men and women, there were slaves and free, there were blue collar workers, there were business owners, there were some that were rich, others that were poor. And what drew them together and what united them together, we find the answer to that in this phrase that Paul, he repeats throughout this passage um, about 11 times. He says in these verses that they, that they were in the Lord, that they were in Christ he commends Prisca and Aquila as fellow workers in Christ. Um, he, he says that Andronicus and Junius were in Christ before me. He calls Amphietus, um, my beloved in the Lord. Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. Apelles, um approved in Christ. Paul sends greetings to those in the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. And so on and so on. This phrase, in Christ in the Lord, that they were brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and as we've been in, in, in Romans, um, we, we've seen this in Romans, that being in Christ through faith is one of those, one of the most important, um, if not the most important designation, de designation that we can, um, that, that can be true of us, that can be true of anyone. That we are in Christ. Paul begins um, Romans 8 um, by stating, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And he says elsewhere in 2 Corinthians 5 17, if anyone is in Christ, that he is a new creation. In Galatians 3 26, he says, For in Christ you are all sons of God through faith. And he ends even in chapter 8 in Romans, he says, um, that there's nothing that will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So what does this mean? To be in Christ, to be in Christ means that we have a saving relationship with him. That they're redeemed, that we're redeemed, that we're forgiven, that we're brought into this union and this communion with him. That we are a new creation. And brought into an inseparable relationship with him because we are in Christ. So whether whether you're wealthy or poor, whether male or female, no matter what your background is, those eternal blessings are offered to you in Christ. If you will trust in him as your Savior and Lord. And this is what Paul cherished the most. This really was the desire of his heart that that we would all be in Christ. And I, I'm sure when, when we're when we're reading this passage and and names are being named, I, I'm sure that some of these people, as they were um, hearing this letter being written, that they were probably ecstatic to hear Paul um, to hear their names mentioned. By Paul. I mean, if you could, you could imagine that you're sitting in in the 
in, in the church and you're hearing this letter being written and, and, and the Apostle Paul, he, he mentions me in there and he encourages me and he commends me for certain things. Um, I'm sure that they were thrilled. I'm sure that we would be thrilled to hear that. But even greater, even greater that, than hearing your name written in this letter um, is knowing that your name is written um, in the book of life. That, that you are in Christ and that your name is written in the book of life. Um, in, in Luke's gospel, there's this, um, there's this time when Jesus sends out his disciples and they, they go out on this, on this short uh, missionary journey. And as they come back, his disciples, they're so excited. They're so ecstatic because they, they were able to experience some great ministry and experience the power of Jesus, which is awesome. But then Jesus says, you know, don't, don't rejoice in that. You know, that stuff is good. But don't rejoice in that. Above all, he says, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So rejoice that your names are written in heaven, that your names are written in the book of life, that you are saved, that you are in Christ. In our passage, we could apply it in the same way. Above all, rejoice, rejoice that your names are written in heaven, in the book of life. Rejoice that you are saved and that you are in Christ. Above all, the mark of a commendable person. It, it's really nothing um, that they've ever done on their own. It, it's the very fact that God has saved them. That they have trusted in Jesus for salvation. That they are in Christ. And, and this is something that is praiseworthy. So four things here that Paul commended. Um, was that he commended their servant's heart. Um, he commended their sacrificial life, um, their, their tireless work, and, and their salvation. So those four things. And, and one more thing to take note of um, is notice that in this passage that they were all ordinary, ordinary men and women. There, there wasn't anything like extraordinary about them, um, especially from, from a worldly perspective. Um, God, uh, Paul, he didn't commend um, anyone spectacular. Um, he didn't greet prominent people. He didn't greet um, well-known people, but his greeting and, com and commendation was to faithful servants, um, sacrificial workers of the gospel, so Paul remembers the ordinary, the day in and day out, faithful servants of the Lord. That's what he commends. So, so the encouragement and the call for us as a church is, is this desire to be faithful to God. To be faithful to him in the big things and in the small things. As we close here, what, what, what is it that um, you want to be remembered for? But what is it that you want to be remembered for? When, when, when you're gone, um, what do you want people to say um, about you? What, what would be the mark of your life? Um, one, one thing that we know for certain is that all these people that were mentioned in this passage, um, all those names is that they're, they're all gone now. They aren't living anymore. And, and really, there's nothing else. Um, for many of them, there's nothing else that we know about them or their lives. Um, but, but one thing is for sure and, and for certain is that at this particular time, during their, during their life, during their time in, in Rome, is that they were very influential and that they were faithful during their time. So the call is just to be faithful. Um, wouldn't it be amazing if, if just a few words that we are remembered by um, are these, is that we would be remembered as a faithful servant, as, as, as a sacrificial servant, as, as one who is generous, um, a tireless worker, fellow worker, in Christ. 
So I pray that these would be um, some of those qualities that we would grow in and that we would be encouraged by and that we would, um, yeah, just grow in our faith in. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Um, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for um, those saints who have gone before us and who have um, just set a great example for us. Lord, I thank you that um, that you have you haven't called us to be spectacular or extraordinary, but you've called us to be faithful. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be faithful in in the big things and in the small things. Lord, I pray that you would grow us as servants. I pray that you would grow us um, as we offer our lives sacrificially to you and to others. Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to, um, to work hard for you, to serve you well. Lord, and that, that we would be continually grateful, Lord, that, that you have called us to be your sons and daughters. Lord, um, we just thank you. I pray that you would um, um, help us to be mindful just of, of your presence and your grace in our lives daily. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.